video, I will discuss the historical average loan to value ratio chart created by the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, Mr. James Bullard. We'll talk about what loan to value ratios mean for both investors, borrowers, and lenders. And we'll look at the data that went into the creation of this chart so that you can get a better idea of what is causing the fluctuations in the chart. And we'll also look at the most updated version of this chart, which I've included as a link in the video description below. And then finally, we'll end with what the chart means for the future of real estate prices in America, and also a few questions for you to answer at the end. So for starters, what is the loan to value ratio? Well, the loan to value ratio is simply the loan amount divided by the property's price. So if we, for example, had a $100,000 property, and the loan amount that a lender is willing to lend on the property is $60,000, well, the loan to value ratio would be 60%, or 60,000 divided by 100,000. In this scenario, the borrower would need to put in $40,000 of a down payment. 40,000 plus 60,000 is the $100,000 property price. And if the loan to value ratio increased to 90%, then the borrower would only need to put down $10,000. So we can see that a higher loan to value ratio means a larger loan amount and a lower down payment for the borrower. So which one do you think is riskier for the lender? Would it be the 90% loan to value ratio or the 60% loan to value ratio? Assuming all other things are equal. Well, if you said, Mark, it's obviously the 90% loan to value ratio, you would be correct. Why is that? Well, let's assume that one year from now, property prices declined by 15%. If they did that, then the value of the property would decline from $100,000 to $85,000. That would mean that the borrower would have negative equity in the project. He would have negative equity of $5,000. That's $85,000 minus the $90,000 loan. When a borrower has negative equity in a property, he doesn't have a huge incentive to continue paying the loan. Why? Well, if he defaulted, he would only lose his original $10,000 investment, not the $15,000 decline in property price. The lender would then get a property that is worth less than the loan amount. If he sold it, he would lose $5,000. He would also have to lose the time and the money involved in the foreclosure process now, if the lender had done a 60% loan to value ratio, the borrower would have to put in a lot more down payment. He'd have a lot more skin in the game, a lot more at risk to lose. And if the property prices came down 15%, he would still have positive equity, but it would be less than his original down payment. In this case, the borrower would still have incentive to continue paying the loan because if he didn't, he could lose his $25,000 of equity. The worst case scenario, if the borrower had to default on the property, would probably be the result of, uh, he'd probably sell the property, sell it for $85,000, pay back the lender his $60,000, and then pocket $25,000, taking a loss of $15,000. So you can see how in this case, from the lender's perspective, a lower loan-to-value ratio is a lot safer for the lender, and typically a lower loan-to-value ratio results in a lower interest rate for the borrower because the risk to the lender is a lot less. Now, from the borrower's perspective, perhaps having a higher loan-to-value ratio to them would be considered less risky because they would only have $10,000 at risk to lose, and they could spread that $40,000 that they had over four different properties and diversify their portfolio. Now, obviously, there's a lot of other things that go into the consideration of the loan-to-value ratio, such as the debt coverage ratio, and the debt to income ratio, which I can discuss in future videos if you'd like. Just put a comment in the co comment section below. But now let's return to this chart. The historical average loan to value ratio chart for mortgaged homeowners in the United States of America. Looking historically, before 2006, it has been 58.4%. Now, after the end of 2005, in 2006, it started to increase dramatically and arose to 90%. Now, why, why in the world did this happen? In order to find out the solution to that question, we need to look at the data behind this chart, which I've got right here. This is uh, 2004. We've got the value of home mortgages for households and nonprofit organizations. 
and then we've got the value of owner-occupied real estate by mortgaged homeowners. Those are homeowners who actually have a loan on their property, which then allows us to create and calculate what the average loan-to-value ratio is of mortgaged homeowners. And you can see here that it was typically around 60%. Now it started to increase right when property prices had reached a peak of about 16 trillion. Looking at just this little section right here, they rose from 12.7 trillion uh, in the middle of 2004 to 16 trillion at the end of 2006. So they rose quite a lot there. Uh, looking at the mortgages, they also rose at around a similar rate because the average loan to value ratio stayed relatively the same. They increased from 7.5 trillion to 9.8 trillion. So looking at this chart, we can see that loan to value ratios are increasing and that is largely due to a increase in mortgages with a decrease in the value of properties, leading to an increase in a loan to value ratio. This continued all the way to loan to value ratio of around 90%. And that was largely due to a decline in the value of properties that reached a bottom in the fourth quarter of 2011. Now, if we continue going here, we can see that the bottom for mortgages was reached in 2012. Uh, value started to increase from 2011, and that is what's causing the loan to value ratio to decline from its peak. And looking at today, it has declined to around 75%, which is largely due to a change in home values. Home values had reached a bottom, remember, when loan-to-value ratios were at a top in 2011, and they had increased by a lot, whereas the value of the mortgages had stayed relatively the same during this time, $9.8 to $9.8 trillion. So that's what's causing the loan to value ratio to decline now. Here's the most updated version of this chart. Remember, James Bullard's chart only went up to around this point in time when we saw them above 90%. And so since then, they've come down to around 75%. So the question is, what would, ta what would it take for the loan to value ratios to come back to their historical levels of around 60%? We're at around 75% today. So what is it going to take to bring these down? Before I get into that, I would just like to point out that here's a simple overview of what we've just talked about. The peak of home values was at fourth quarter of 2006, where there were 16 trillion. At that point in time, mortgage debt was 9.8 trillion. So as a result, loan to value ratios were around 60%. Uh, the bottom of home values, fourth quarter of 2011, value was 10.8 trillion. So they had come down about 50% over this five year period. Now, the mortgage debt really didn't change that much. It came down 0.3%, which is why loan to value ratios rose by 31.8%. So this is largely due to valuations of homes. If we're looking at the peak and bottom of mortgage debt, we can see that loan to value ratios rose during this time as well because the mortgage debt declined at a lower pace than the decline of home valuations. So the question that I would like to leave you off with today is to give me four possible different scenarios that would result in home prices declining back to their historical 60% levels. Remember, we're looking at what they are today they're around 75%. Home values have come up. Mortgage values have stayed pretty much the same. And then I would like you uh, to think about which scenario you think is most likely and why. Now, I'll include my answer key to this, but there's really no wrong or right answer um, to these questions of why you think which is most likely and, and uh, you know why you think that. So uh, feel free to check it out after you've given this some thought. And let me know what you think. What do you think about this chart? Has it uh, helped you to get a better idea of where we're at in the real estate cycle? Hope you enjoy the chart. Have a great day.